I am Bevan Clare, and I am the Program Director of the Masters of Science in Clinical Herbal Medicine at MUIH. I'm an herbalist and a nutritionist. I am here today to talk a little bit about springtime health. We are amazingly starting spring. It's a little early. Ideally, I would be talking about this in like a couple weeks um, because I, I'm currently in Boston and uh, just got a big snowstorm and it definitely does not feel like spring here, but I know in many places it is. I usually live in Maryland and I know there's some signs of spring, like the skunk cabbage is coming up and um, it's uh, it's looking nice and, and green in some places. And I love those you know early spring signs where things just start like to bubble up from the earth. And, uh, and I think us humans start to kind of bubble up from the earth as well during those times, depending on where we live and, uh, and how aligned we are with the seasons. So today, um, this is an Ask the Herbalist session, and I am here to answer some questions, to offer some tips, um, anything about springtime health and preparing for spring. So if you have questions, I'd love for you to type them into the chat or I can unmute you and you can ask me your question. It can be anything to do with like herbs, um, a little bit of nutrition and springtime health, what, um, what springtime health means to you, what you're looking for uh, in making sure that you are as healthy as possible for the spring. And um, yeah, so so please fire away with your questions. Until I see some questions coming in, I will go ahead and get started with some of my thoughts around springtime health uh, and just a little bit about it. So, so I think what's interesting is this means different things for different people. And on an evolutionary, from an evolutionary angle too, it really depends on where you are from in the world. Of course, Many peoples in the world don't have, they don't have like a winter spring transition. They might have like wet season or monsoon season, um, rainy season, things like that, but it's not like it gets cold and everything dies back. And that only happens in, you know, areas that are further north or further south from the equator and those temperate areas where we have that. Um, and that's, you know, when that happens, that is really like all of, of nature um, that has to do with those days getting shorter and the nights getting longer. So that's, you know, why that all, all happens. And if you are living in those places, of course, you are also impacted by the days getting shorter um, and the nights getting longer and, um, and vice versa in the summer. So, so, you know, I always think it's very interesting that like humans have the same opportunity opportunity to thrive, whether they are, uh, you know, in really cold places or whether they are in warm places. It's not like, you know, this, this is an opportunity only for people who live in summer all the time places, or if we absolutely have to have winter, but, um, but, you know, for, for many of us, um, <clears throat> we are going to be impacted by what's happening outside. Now, this is a lot less because, of course, if we were living outside, like if I was living outside here in Boston, um, I would not be doing probably a lot other than at the peak warm hours. I'd be trying to stay as warm as possible and I'd be going to sleep really early because it's dark. Um, and it's, uh, you know, if it's dark, then you're probably not going to be able to do a ton. So, uh, so those, you know, different daylight hours, but I, you know, we, we have all of this innovation. So humans, of course, are living indoors a lot of the time and that changes everything. So uh, some of this is, has been altered by our lifestyles. Like, you know, we actually have access to light after it gets dark and access to a lot of heat and, and all of that. So we're dealing with very different health issues. Like we're living outside. We'd be in most places, there'd be a lot of issues with damp and cold, but instead we have a lot of issues with dryness because of indoor heating uh, in the winter time. But as we come into spring, I think we start, you know, the, the line between the indoors and the outdoors starts to blur a little bit. We're a little outdoors more. We're noticing things outdoors more. And that has a lot to do with, you know, being less kind of internal and switching to becoming more um, external. So if you have any questions, feel free to add them into the um, Q&A or into the chat. I can see them in both. I do see one question in that I will get to, but uh, we need more questions. What's what, what are you thinking about? How to support yourself in spring? And if you have a way that you like to you, you know that, that that helps you to adjust to the spring or springtime and a ritual or pattern that you like to have, I'd love to hear about it. 
So I think the first thing that I wanted to address that a lot of people ask about when they talk about springtime is the idea of doing a cleanse or a detox. Uh, so I may not be aligned with the answers of a lot of natural healthcare professionals in that I think our bodies are actually really good at detoxifying all the time. Like we have incredible systems for detoxification. And, and part of this is because we've always needed these things. You know, although we have very different uh, things that we're exposed to nowadays, as far as toxicity goes, that we weren't exposed to in the past, um, the systems are very present to be able to eliminate those toxins from our system. So I don't think that, you know, specifically we need a completely different like a, a detox to actually rid ourselves of toxins. But I do think that doing kind of a spring cleanse or something that's a little bit healthier in the spring to kind of shift from one energy to another in our, in our health can, can be really beneficial and, um, and can make a lot of, of sense. And I noticed that someone has enabled closed captioning. If I'm speaking too quickly or if you need a clarification on anything, please feel free to reach out to me now or after. Uh, I will go ahead and actually put my email address into the chat. There may be a delay between me being able to be between now and me being able to get back to you um, for the person who has entered the closed captioning, but I will do my best. Um, let's see. There we go. Uh, so we so so when I think about cleansing, one of the first things that comes to mind is, of course, diet. And um, I don't necessarily think that people need to do like a whole fast and a juicing thing or any of the you know dramatic things that people do. But I think what might be nice for a cleanse um, is maybe the opposite of what everyone's thinking, which is taking things away, but maybe adding things in. So I think that if there's certain foods that don't make you feel great, that make you feel heavier, like let's say you really like to eat a lot of um, sugary treats or you uh, find that fried foods don't always feel great in your body, you can go ahead and um, you know, maybe reduce those. So you can take a week and be like, okay, I'm going to avoid fried food this week and or I'm going to avoid the sugary treats or I'm going to try not to drink caffeine after noon or I'm going to do this. But more importantly, I think is actually like adding things in. So that's what I love to do for a cleanse, um, which is a funny idea, but is to add things into your diet uh, and see how that goes. So the most important flavor in the springtime is really kind of a sour flavor, which is the flavor of a lot of our young greens that start popping up, that kind of sour flavor, but can also be lemon, it can be spinach, it can be um, anything that's tart. So you can find like different tart flavors in herbal medicines. And so the sour and kind of the bitter as well, those are the two flavors that I would be thinking the most about is how to add in more sour and more bitter freshness into your life. So, you know, that might be um, the idea of adding in like fresh lemon water in the morning and it, or it doesn't have to be lemon. People are always using lemon water, but it actually can be something like fresh um, grapefruit water in the morning is a great one to do. Or um, grapefruit is a really nice springtime food because it is tart. Um, it's sour, it's bitter. Lemon, you get the sour element, but not the bitter. So you can do some kind of fresh of those juices. I think also bitters, you know, there's a lot of different bitters out there. You can buy all different herbal bitters and you can try adding those to your food. You can also find bitter greens. Um, grocery stores that carry a wider variety of greens always do sell bitter greens. So if you, if you go to like the lettuce section, you'll see things like radicchio or endive or arugula or chicory um, or frise. So some of those like funky looking greens and lettuces can be really great. And if you're not used to the bitter flavor, my advice is to kind of take it with an open mind. You know, don't, don't think that bitter equals bad. Think about it as like a fresh, clean, kind of dispersing, lightening flavor and get used to those bitter greens. It can be a really good, um, good thing to do. So, you know, starting your morning with like some, some lemon water, some warm lemon water or cool lemon water, um, having, you know, bitter greens in your daily diet and having a lot of uh, green things. There's some really wonderful recipes out there for springtime soups. So food does not have to be cold to be cleansing. I don't really know where that idea came from that it needs to be like raw and cold to be, to be cleansing. It, your body does have to work harder to digest food that is raw. Um, 
or even sometimes cold, but that doesn't mean it's like more detoxifying or more cleansing to not have heated or cooked food. So there's a lot of wonderful, like, um, springtime soups that are warm and nourishing that you can use that are a really nice way to kind of cleanse or detoxify. You can think about them that way um, without anything that's too harsh. And greens in general are great for the spring. So, you know, loading up on your new gre- on your greens. If you're not a huge greens eater, you can always try like a new green uh, every couple of days for a week and adding those greens into your diet, find some great recipes online. Um, look at what, what those could be like th- things like collards or kale or a chicory. Um, there's so many different things that you'll find out there as greens. And I think when we go to the grocery store, we often tend to just like pick one thing or another, but, uh, that we're used to, but go ahead and look at some of the other possibilities and you might be surprised with what's out there. Um, you know, when we talk about bitters, You know, there's a lot of different bitters out there. Some of my favorites are things like artichoke, um, bitter orange is a little bit more warming, um, mugwort, the artemisias as bitters. And there's things, there's a lot of great bitter companies out there, like Urban Moonshine has some fun bitters. There's a lot of different companies you can find your, um, your bitters from. And, And there's actually a lot of traditional liqueurs and things that can also be uses bitters like Campari, stuff like that. Um, so if you know, if you're like a beer or wine drinker fairly regularly, you could always try Campari and soda, which is very bitter. Um, soda meaning like soda water, uh, or sparkling water. And that's an interesting way to, um, shake things up a little bit and try that. I see a question about chicory being bad for the thyroid. I, so I know I've never heard that before. Um, so chicory has two different parts that are generally used. And uh, so there's the root, which is high in inulin, um, which is not insulin. It's inulin, which is a a prebiotic. It's a type of of fiber. And it's just wonderful for the liver and digestion, chicory root is, and and also bitter. And then there's the leaves, which are also bitter, containing less inulin. And they just have some nice bitter elements. So I, you know, there's, there's, there are certain herbs that are contraindicated um, in thyroid conditions, but I've never heard that. So if you do find something, then, um, some more information about that, or you get more information, feel free to drop me a line about it, but I've absolutely never heard that with chicory. Uh, so some other ideas is, is liver support. So I love the idea of liver support. We were just talking about chicory. One of my favorite liver supportive products that's out there, and I have no affiliation with this company, is um, there's a dandelion coffee called Dandy Blend. And even if you're like a diehard coffee person, it doesn't mean you have to stop drinking coffee to use these. You can always just try it, add it in. And what I like about Dandy Blend is it's um, like a cold dissolvable. It's a it's a it's a like a dried powdered extract. Um, so you can add it to like hot or cold water. It makes great iced coffee. And, or you can add a hot water to it. And so that's great. My kids love that as well. We'll do dandy blends and as I'll throw it in with like a banana and some yogurt or oat milk or something as a smoothie. Um, and, uh, that's like a creamy coffee kind of smoothie thing. Um, so the other thing is to think about lymphatics. There's a lot of different lymphatics. I think lemon is a really nice lymphatic, but one of my favorites is something that actually comes up in the spring is um, dandelion roots and dandelion leaves. So really any of your early spring greens that you can forage, if you live in an area where you have access to the wilderness or to you know, a, a healthy weedy patch, is things like dandelion leaves are fantastic. Um, you can you know make a salad out of those or add little pieces of them into your salad or just even pick them up and nibble on them. Uh, if you have a lot of neighbors and you're not spraying, you can make your neighbors think you're really nuts if you sit out there and just start eating your lawn. But dandelions are great. And then a wonderful lymphatic is red clover. One of our first flowers we get is those red clover blossoms um, in fields. And you can you can even plant red clover. I mean, it just grows like kind of like in grass. Um, if you have a, a weedy patch, feel free to try sowing some red clover and you can eat those flowers in salads or drink tea out of them. And it's wonderful kind of lymphatic supportive medicine. So I love those. So that's a little bit about kind of like the spring cleansing piece. I see some questions that have come in. Um, there is a question about cannabis on health. You know, it's, it's probably, I don't see any like specifically springtime pieces on this. What I would recommend is checking out one of the webinars by uh, John Corey or uh, Bodhi Timms that MUH has. They work a lot in the cannabis program that we have. 
And they would be definitely the best people to ask specifically about that. Um, if you have any specific questions. I see a question that has about allergies and spring pollen. That is going to be my next topic. So you'll get to hear a little bit more about that in a moment. And um, see some more about you know, headaches during spring season associated with some allergies. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and somebody shared that they did a liver cleanse in November and it balanced their hormones from what they've noticed. So that's one of the cool things about, about, you know, our liver is, works really hard. It's, uh, you know, it can be very overwhelmed and, uh, it is a little bit like the great control center. I mean, your brain is the great control center, but the liver has a lot to do with the detoxification. Um, and, you know, we think a lot about like the hormones that we need and the different types of endocrine um, elements that we need to keep our body and our metabolism and so on in line and, and our hormone systems in line. But, uh, a lot of that has to do with how quickly we are eliminating those things from our body. And so supporting your liver health can actually do really wonderful things to adding, you know, support for the, um, the different pieces that, that, you know, you absolutely have to have for your health. And, um, <clears throat> and supporting your liver. So, you know, so how do you support your liver? Well, all those bitter flavors support your liver, all the sour flavors support your liver. And if you really want to focus on your liver, I would say something like dandelion and milk thistle. There's some great products out there with them. There's a lot of like liver health teas and um, herb supplements, but I think especially looking at like dandelion and milk thistle, um, maybe some schizandra, those are some of the best things to look at that are safe and well tolerated for, um, for your liver health. So, okay, we've been up with these questions here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about allergies. So this is like the quintessential springtime thing, right? And they, there's a lot going on. So um, one of the first things you can do is, is, if you're interested in this, is to start noticing what you're actually allergic to. And things kind of come in phases. So a lot of people that are allergic in the spring are allergic to tree flowers. So you might not even, you might be like, oh, tree flowers, those are those big, pretty things on trees. They're not. Um, the springtime ones are pretty, but they're usually very subtle and hard to see. And you can like, you know, for example, the first one is maple in a lot of areas. And you'll start to see your forest get a little bit of like a red tinge to it. I, um, my kitchen kind of overlooks the valley. And when the maples are flowering, which is the first thing that happens before there's any sign of green, I mean, it'll be all brown, gray. And then I'll start to see this kind of reddish hue that gets on the top of the trees. And that is the maples flowering. So they're the first ones that flower and drop pollen. And then a lot of the first green that you see isn't necessarily leaves or young leaves. They're actually the trees flowering. So you can find out, you know, is it the oak flowers? Is it the maple? So you can get an idea of that and then watch you know, what they're doing. So you know what to expect. And I think that helps. Uh, there's also sometimes a lot of like exposure to leaf mold and molds out there during the springtime. And that can, that can definitely impact your uh, health and well-being as far as the moldy pieces. And that's a little harder to, to kind of stay away from. Um, so what can you do for these allergies? Well, you know, one of the useful things with um, with all of those COVID masks that we have around is that they can also be really helpful for pollen. So if, you know, on a practical level, before we get to herbs, if you're not, if you don't have like an air filter in your house, or if you can get a, a HEPA quality air filter that you can run, if you have the resources for that, that can be really helpful to be running that. And if you're going to be out in certain areas, if it's your inclination, you can wear a mask to help with pollen exposure. Um, so, so that aside, um, you know, the pollen really is everywhere and, um, and it is really hard. And we do have like absolutely fantastic medications that can help, but they do have side effects for a lot of people if they don't feel great when they're taking their allergy medications. So a lot of the times, you know, herbs are definitely not the same as, as allergy medications. They just don't work in the same way. Allergy medications like have a very directed, very specific kind of suppressing activity on a lot of the things that cause allergies. Herbs are a little bit more about kind of modulating systems and balance. So what I think is really the best to do is to try to use herbs and natural things as much as you can. And then when it feels like your allergies are just impacting your quality of life too much, then you can use your medications, but then you can go back to the herbs as soon as you feel like that's going to be enough. So trying to have like various tools can be great to do that. Um, 
And so, so, you know, use your medications as you need to, but also there's a number of different herbs that are really helpful. A lot of people find nettles, which is my background here. And uh, this is stinging nettle. And it's actually really easy to grow if you have a weedy patch. Um, it'll grow really like anywhere. And it's pretty aggressive. So don't plant a lot of nettles if you... Um, if you're going to be walking in that area because it does sting, but they are so wonderful for cooking um, and uh, just to have around and for making tea and for eating. And so, um, and so there's a lot of options for getting nettles. I mean, they can also be wild harvested in a lot of places, or you can buy dried nettles to make tea or buy a nettles tea product. So nettles can be really helpful to take, you know, kind of leading up to the pollen times and then during the pollen times. And that can be capsules or teas or tinctures of nettles. Another one I really like is licorice root. So licorice root can be helpful as an anti-inflammatory and um, licorice root can sometimes also play fairly well with allergy medication. If you know you wanna take, you may be able to lower your frequency or dose of allergy medication if you are also concurrently using licorice. With licorice, it can be a tea or you can do a capsule of like a half a gram a day or 500 milligrams a day or twice a day. If um, you're an adult, uh, you can do that. If you are hypertensive, if you have high blood pressure, you know, licorice can sometimes raise blood pressure a little bit, but just keep an eye on it. It's, it's not gonna make your blood pressure go crazy or anything like that. It just, um, you know, it, it has that possibility. So that's something to, to keep an eye on with licorice, but it isn't necessarily contraindicated to have that. You can also buy deglycerized de 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 licorice that won't have the pieces that do that, but you also do lose some of the medicinal effect. Um, another herb that is great for springtime allergies is, is an herb called eyebright or euphrasia. And um, you wanna make sure because this herb is threatened in the wild that you buy this from an organic cultivated source, not wild crafted. And, um, and ivory is just pretty fantastic. It has, uh, you know, it, it just, it's one of the first things that I would look at for any type of histamine response. And so that's something you could definitely fool around with. You can use herbs in combination. That's typically how herbalists would use them. Like if you saw an herbalist, we'd make a formula and put all these herbs together. If you're interested in meeting with a student herbalist, we do have a clinic that our um, graduate students, once they are towards the end of the program, are practicing in. There is a charge for, do, for seeing them because they work alongside really experienced practitioners, but they could come up with like a customized formula and you could get that from our dispensary or wherever you wanted to do that. So if you're interested in that, please, um, let me actually give you the information. Um, I'm gonna give you Jillian Bar Ov's information and they can be reached at, um, so there is, so that's, you know, a couple of the things. I, the, uh, the fourth herb that I wanted to mention is an herb called Baikal Skullcap. So this is different than the thing that you often see that is Skullcap, this is Baikal Skullcap. And uh, this is a Chinese herb, it's a root and it isn't, you know, we, we, in the West, we wouldn't use it as much as tea. So we would use it more in like a capsule or a tincture, but this is also safe and well-tolerated. Um, this is safe for children and can really help with allergies. So all the things that I mentioned are generally safe and generally safe also for children in smaller doses. Um, if you have questions, you can see an herbalist or you can ask your um, primary care provider, which they may or may not know the answer to whether you can use them safely. Uh, if you are on medications that have a really narrow therapeutic range, like anti-epileptic medications or something like that, you may want to reach out to an herbalist. But to use these a little bit for allergies is generally fine. Another thing that some people find helpful is using a neti pot. If you've never heard of a neti pot, it's an Ayurvedic a uh, little water pot looks like a genie lamp that you, you pour into your sinuses. And that can be helpful if, especially if it's like a sinus thing that you get or a sinus headache that you get um, can be really, really wonderful. Um, so that, that I would recommend all of those things. And also sometimes breathing exercises. When you have a place that is clear of pollen, like if you have a clean room in your house where you run your um, HEPA filter, you can do breathing exercises. You can even get an aromatherapy diffuser and put something that's supportive like um, lavender or even a little eucalyptus for young lung health and uh, do some deep breathing can be very helpful because that's, you know, your lungs can be pretty uh, overwhelmed. 
I see a question about taking licorice. You know, licorice is taken long term from by many people, but I would work with a practitioner or have a little have enough knowledge to be able to do that. But I would say it's fine to take licorice like during allergy season, you know, six weeks or something like that. But I wouldn't necessarily take it forever um, unless you know that it's a good fit for you. And uh, and licorice tea, you know, is often the best way to to take something like that. So um, questions about allergies that come up. You know, it's a, it's a very interesting thing, I, you know, our, the allergies that we have, because it's, it's a relatively new thing in human evolution that we have these types of allergies, you know, that we have um, seasonal allergies to pollen. And a lot of it just has to do with the limited immune challenges that we experience as, um, as humans, because, uh, you know, in the past, we would have a lot more like infectious sorts of disease and that would you know modulate our immune system a little bit so we didn't have as many uh, as many um we well it would sometimes just kill off some of us in the earlier times but if you know when we had all of these infections it's the that of the hygiene hypothesis the flip side of it that our immune system would be regulated a little bit different um differently. So I see a question about local honey. So I think local honey is also really great. If you have local honey from local bees, you know, absolutely. That's a, a phenomenal way to introduce yourself to some of the local pollen. And it's also really nice to support your local beekeepers. Um, you know, if you can find them at a local farmer's market or roadside stand, if you have a place like a roadside stand place that um, has fresh eggs, that they have from chickens, they're great people to ask where you can get local pollen to or at a farmer's market, local honey. And uh, so that's a great thing. You can you can get local raw honey and use that like as medicine. You don't necessarily use that for cooking and things, but you can take like a little quarter teaspoon a day. And a lot of people find that that is very helpful for them actually to take, to take that. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, that's helpful. All right. Keep the questions rolling in. I see a question about elderberry and autoimmune disease. It's not specifically for spring, but um, but I thought, you know, I'll go ahead and, and say that, no, it's not contraindicated in autoimmune disease. I mean, the immune system is just a lot more nuanced and complicated than thinking something that, you know, that supports or promotes immune health is going to hurt somebody who has autoimmune disease, it's much more subtle. So um, is elderberry contraindicated for you personally? You know, that's when you have autoimmune disease, you often don't know what is going to be uh, safe and effective for you and what isn't. But, it, you know, even when it isn't safe and effective for you, it's not like a disaster. You know, you would take it and you would notice, you know, a little more inflammation or something along those lines. So, you, you know, it, the caveat goes with all herbs that um, that sometimes it can, you know, upset the apple cart, but in general, it is not contraindicated in that way. Um, so some other things that I wanted to mention. One is the idea of movement in springtime. Um, you, uh, you know, movement is a really, really fantastic tool to have. And in the spring, we really do need to move a little bit more. Uh, our lymphatic health is so important. So, you know, and, and whatever movement means to you, it's just, if you want to increase your movement, unless you're like an avid exerciser, then, you know, keep doing what you're doing. But if you're a person that's like, oh, you know, I, I really should be moving more. It doesn't have to be a lot. In fact, like one of the great ways to support movement and lymphatic flow is to just raise your hands above your head a few times a day. This seems really silly, but actually this is like hugely lymphatic drainage in here. Um, and uh, for part particularly with, for people that have larger breasts or um, female breasts, you can, you know, when you do this, like it drains all of those lymphatics. So movement might be like your commitment to, to do this like 10 times a day or three times a day, even uh, you can do it right now. Hopefully you probably are, and I can't see you doing it. Um, and, uh, and then even just to get out and take a little bit of a walk or do some stretching or something like that. And, uh, you know, if you're trying to actually increase your exercise, there can be herbal medicines that can help. One of my favorites is ashwagandha or, um, with Thania. and ashwagandha can be wonderful for helping support um, more exercise, a little bit more endurance, you know, getting out there more. And I really, you know, I really love it. I think that it, we're going to talk about it for a couple things, but it helps for people to have a lot more energy um, and stamina. 
So, um, you know, how it does that, it's not stimulating at all. In fact, it's actually calming for a lot of people. So sometimes, so one of the ways it works is by increasing the quality of your sleep, but it also can help with just overall stamina and energy levels during the day. So ashwagandha can be great. It's um, a funky tasting herb. It doesn't always taste great as a tea. I recommend it as a tincture or, um, or as a, uh, powder capsule. You can add the powder into your smoothies and things like that. Again, it doesn't taste great, but it's not the worst thing in the world. And um, so if you haven't, you know, ashwagandha has a lot of indications in a kind of mood imbalances and energy, love, decreased energy and um, people that have a lot of anxiety. Uh, ashwagandha has a lot of indications there. So we'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment also. But another thing for exercise could be using healthy caffeine wisely. Like if you, um, you know, you can have a little bit of green tea or mate or something like that. If you need a little extra boost, sometimes bitters can be helpful for people, but you'll find the more you move, the more you move, um, you get, you know, more extra, more energy and exercise, and you'll be able to, uh, probably feel a little bit more, um, um, like you have a little bit more vigor to get out there and, uh, and all that, but exercise can be wonderful for the spring. And what I recommend is actually having some morning time exercise. So trying to increase your, um, morning activity can be a wonderful thing in the springtime, um, getting up maybe a little bit earlier, trying to see that sunshine and actually getting that sunshine. So your, your thymus gland and the way, I mean, your body actually like recognizes the sunshine as, um, something that's changing. So, uh, you know, I do a lot of traveling, so I know with jet lag, one of the best things I can do for resetting my internal clock is for letting my body see the sun. It's funny. I'm talking about the sun and the sun is like streaming in behind me from this window right now. Um, but getting in and, you know, getting in and getting that sunlight and just soaking it up and like, you know, feeling it on your skin can be really, really important. Uh, so I highly recommend that when I mentioned green tea, um, um, and I see somebody asked about mate. I think both of those are great. You need to figure out how your body responds to them um, as an individual. Our response to caffeine is highly individualized. And um, there's many people that can't have it at all. There's many people that can't have it afternoon. There's some people that, many people that can have it like right before they go to bed and it doesn't impact them. But if you're not waking rested and, or you need an alarm to wake up, even though you're getting enough sleep, then uh, you may want to try cutting caffeine out as one of your cleansing things, or just try it bef only before noon and see if it does impact your quality of sleep. But I think mate and green tea are great antioxidant, wonderful um, therapeutics. So those are, are really pretty great to be consuming. Um, so that brings me to the final topic I wanted to talk about today. And feel free to add your questions in if you want me to uh, answer some more is the idea of sleep as being an important thing in the springtime. We think about that in the winter because it's like hibernating time and we, we can often be good at that, but you know, the springtime is a time when, you know, you want to have more energy. You want to be able to get out there more and sleep is one of the best ways to do this. And what's nice is most people like to sleep. Like if I'm telling you to exercise or get more movement or eat a bunch of bitter stuff or, you know, stop drinking caffeine, all of that is, is not always so fun, but sleeping is like, yeah, sleeping. And one of the best herbs for supporting healthy sleep is ashwagandha, which I already mentioned is really helpful for energy levels and so on, but it can really promote deep sleep. So um, taking ashwagandha even in the morning, like a morning dose and an evening dose can be a nice way to promote your healthy sleep and quality rest um, is a great thing. Another herb that um, I think is fantastic is chamomile. Chamomile is just fantastic. Um, it's, you know, you might already have some around, don't underestimate it just cause it's like a simple old fashioned little herb, but drinking a cup of chamomile tea near bedtime can help with restful sleep and feeling calm and, um, getting that. And of course, having movement during the day also helps with sleep if you're getting that, um, passion flower is another one. I think passion flower, you can also find like chamomile passion flower teas. There's a ton of sleeping teas that are out there. I, uh, I really like a lot of the tea brands that are out there on the shelves today, like Paca, Traditional Medicinals, um, Mountain Rose has a lot of great teas. Yogi has a lot of great teas. Twinings has a number of um, 
of uh, herbal teas now. So you can find a lot of great, like kind of sleep supportive teas out there to try some of those. But ashwagandha, chamomile, and passion flower are some of my favorite herbs, ashwagandha less in tea. And then I think also for sleeping, that waking early thing and trying to get your, one of the things for spring is like trying to, if you've been staying up too late and sleeping in too late, trying to shift your schedule into that because your circadian rhythms are one of the most important things for your health. Trying to get on a healthy, if you get a healthy circadian rhythm where you wake up and you're active and you get some sunshine, um, those things are really, really wonderful. So um, a great question. I've got, definitely got an herbalist in the audience here asking about ashwagandha and nightshade sensitivities. So, um, you know, I have not seen that be a problem generally. If people can try taking it and see, but, you know, people who have nightshade sensitivities can often be um, sensitive, of course, to things like tomatoes and eggplant and peppers in particular, um, potatoes less so generally, but, um, and ashwagandha is in the nightshade family, but I have not seen it be an issue. And I don't know if it's because it's the root um, and the roots tend, maybe don't tend to have some of the same, like the solanic acid. I'm, I'm just guessing why that is, but, um, but the, the ashwagandha tends to be well tolerated in that way. So, so we're, we're starting to wrap this up. If you have more questions, feel free to type them in. But the idea here is that, you know, welcoming in spring can be as simple as just setting up a plan. You know, go ahead and pick a week or pick two weeks and be like, here's, I'm going to take these things out of my life for those two weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, I say, I was talking about, about food and herbs and things, but you can even do things like sensationalist media out of your life or, you know, make sure or only reading your um, media or staying away from something that tends to stress you out during that time or doing more of something that tends to really nourish you. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as adding, looking up some of those spring soups and broths is wonderful. Um, herbal teas that we talked about, some of those detoxifying and cleansing herbal teas, those bitters in your life, uh, adding in some of those greens. Um, and, uh, um, then also, you know, getting out there, getting movement, getting sunshine, um, and some of the ways to prevent allergies, you know, those are all really, really key things. So a couple more questions came in. Oh, when am I writing a new book? I don't know. I need ideas for like what book I should write. Uh, I'm totally open to any suggestions. Feel free to email me with suggestions, but, uh, but I'd love to, to write a new book sometime soon. Thank you. And, um, Good herbs for headaches instead of over-the-counter things. Yeah, so, you know, this is a tricky thing because, of course, if you get a once-in-a-while headache, you know, the over-the-counter stuff works really well. Um, you know, every every couple months, you get a little headache, you take a Advil or a Tylenol, it's gone, you know, great. But uh, but if it's something that comes up more regularly, if trying to find the, the, the root cause of it, whether it's kind of a circulation thing or an inflammation thing, um, or liver thing, because there's all different kinds of headaches that people get. I would say working with a practitioner or just trying something like ashwagandha or um, holy basil that's a little bit of an adaptogen to just see if it helps support you. But it's really, I would try to also kind of figure out what's bringing them on um, would be good. So that would be, and also, if, you know, if it, if it ends up being a pharmaceutical that works best for you and it's working for you and not causing issues, then I would also... Um, you know, I would, I would also not beat yourself up about it. I mean, they're, you know, they, we, we should do what works best for us and supports us really well. If it's working for us when it's not, then that's where, you know, we got to find, we've got to find more things, but some of those herbs, uh, it can be really helpful in those situations. Well, thank you everyone for a skull cap for a headache is great. You know, I think all of these nervines can be great for a headache. <laughs> thank you. You're, you're a great herbalist. I appreciate that. Um, Thank you everyone for coming and for bringing me your springtime questions. And I will do another one of these in the autumn for winter health, which is always fun. Um, I'm always open to your ideas of what webinars would be helpful and useful. Uh, feel free to send me an email or a message with any ideas that you have. Um, and uh, yeah, take care everyone. Enjoy the spring and get out there, stay well. Enjoy that weather. And if it's not spring where you are, I look, I wish you spring soon um, where you can enjoy those, those flowers and leaves and pollen and all that good stuff. So, all right. Take care, take care, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.